Welcome to the very latest edition of the Premier View Tipperary GAA podcast. Don't forget to give us a follow if you haven't done so already on Twitter. We are at Premier View Pod. On Facebook, our page is the Premier View Podcast and on Instagram, where we are Premier View Podcast. We have up to the minute news on all things Tip GAA across all our socials, plus the odd giveaway so don't miss out. If you're a Spotify listener, don't forget to hit follow and also hit the bell so that you never miss a podcast episode. Hello and welcome to the Premier View podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Humphrey Kelleher author of A Place to Play, The People and Stories Behind 101 GA Grounds. Humphrey, congratulations on a great book, a great anthology of GA Grounds from all around the country. Uh, the Four Corners, It's a, I think it was a real labour of love. But, um, I'm absolutely delighted to see it. some of the, I suppose, just to give a, an introduction to the book, it's not just the county ground or the main county ground of each county. It goes into some great stories, some, vi- you know, there's some really vivid pictures from both present and past. There's some great drone footage there. It's a re- It would really be a great Christmas present for, I suppose, the GA fan. And I'd say also the geographer in your it, in, in your in your life so you know how did you come about this idea of of the book to put it all together and why because it must have driven you mad at times you know going everywhere and i i i think you hit the nail on the head it did drive me it took, it took me 10 years kevin to do this book but it came from an idea i had about 15 years ago i came up with an idea about the cups the gaa cups and trophies they were called after people that people don't know who they were, like Lee McCarthy, Fitzgibbon, Sigerson, Sam McGuire. So I did that book and I brought it out in 2013. Then I decided on my second idea, which was the grounds. And uh, being from Dungarvan in Waterford, I uh, have uh, you know great pitch down there called Fraher Field. And I just felt that a lot of people mightn't be aware of who Fraher was. And then I started thinking about, you know, Semple Stadium. I thought about Walsh Park, Nolan Park, all the grounds. And uh, I started working on their uh, history of those people. But as I went along, I found that I was only skimping the surface of what was out there. There was an awful lot of uh, knowledge uh, and information that was lacking in the actual grounds themselves, the pitch, the place that people play on. And therefore, I said, I started looking at who bought the land, who put their hands in their pockets the first day and were able to come up with the land. So it was an intriguing journey to find out how did all of those things happen. And it wasn't easy to get the information, but that's why that's why it took ten years, Kevin, to to end up with what I ended up with. Absolutely, and it, certainly the the output, as I said, is 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 fantastic there, and it, it really was worth it. And this is look, we're this is a Tipperary podcast, and we're you know Tipperary focus, and I'm delighted to say there's three grounds featuring Tipperary. There's the home of hurling, which is Conmel Sports Field, the real home of hurling. There's McDonough Park in Nina, and there's of course Semple Semple Stadium in hurling. I suppose the main county ground. But you know, just to take those three as an example, there's some great kind of vignettes and stories there. I mean, <laughs> a couple of the ones we we won't go too much into why the stand is where it is in Conmel. Uh, it might have been put to stop a few people from, you know, as it says in the book, viewing from the clinic up above. And you know what? Actually, when the, the sports field was, this was initially the Clonmel Hospital was the workhouse in famine times. So they were really, they were really kind of begrudging, I suppose, a few people watching a, a GE match there. But I suppose Taurus, then one of the stories that jumps out is shot. They actually had shotguns for prizes. Uh, well, wouldn't it? Yeah, they did well. Whether they had them or not, there's I I I have found. Uh, I went back over it again to find the article that was it. It was written in um the the, the paper of the day. Um, I'm not sure it was the Nationalist or what paper it was, but uh, in fact, Liam uh, O'Donoghue, who has written a fantastic book on Semple Stadium uh, as well, and we would have chatted about this, but they. 
Tipperary wanted to be a bit better than everybody else, and they wanted to have a program or a uh, a tournament that would attract, as they said, the best teams from Cork, Tipperary, and Dublin to come and play in this particular tournament because they needed to raise money for Sample Stadium. And uh, they, um, of course, it wasn't called Sample Stadium those days, as you know, but um, the amount of um, effort that they had put into it is amazing. They didn't want to be just giving out medals. Everybody gave out medals. They wanted to stand out to have an extraordinary um, tournament to give. And, and as a consequence of that, they wanted an extraordinary prize. So the committee decided that they would give as the first prize double barrel shotguns to the winning teams. Now, I checked and looked and investigated, did it actually ever happen? But I can assure you, Kevin, that the committee had decided that they would give out the double barrel shotguns. Now, I, I have never found out what was the end result, but it was amusing to see that that's the type of, I suppose, the, the amount of uh, determination they had to get the teams coming in. So they wanted to give a, an appropriate prize, but I'm not sure if it ever actually happened. Yeah, and of course, you've as a result of this project, um, you've been to all sorts of GA grounds and things. And is it funny then, from your perspective, how a lot of these grounds were established around the turn of the twentieth century, say, and, and and going forward in the twenty years after that, say, from the nineteen tens onwards, the revolutionary years? How and this book, I suppose, to a degree, puts administrators to the forefront, you know, and the the stories, their biographies, and the vision, uh, entail there. But you know. From your perspective, then, isn't it funny how many of these grounds became so intrinsic to the life of of towns? I see, you know, circuses being held. Again, we mentioned Turles there, the trip to Tip Semples, uh, in, in Semple Stadium. Like, how intrinsic they are now in, into the life of a town. They are. It was the place to go. It, it, it was the the area of, 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 of gathering that people had. But back in the early days, they just did not have their own places because the owners of the land were the landed gentry, really, who did not want to give any land and a loan of a pitch to uh, what, what was being deemed as maybe a nationalist um, um, group of people within their town. And they might have been happy enough to give their land to the rugby or the cricket or maybe soccer, but they were certainly... Uh, outside the, the 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 pale at that time, so they were dependent very much on farmers, uh, friendly farmers who might give them a loan of a piece of land for a while, mm. but there was no great guarantee that they would continue to have that piece of land. So they might have it only for a a, a match or two, and it was always only a, a loan. It was the being kind hearted farmers who gave them that land, and of course they would have had to have the space then to lay out a pitch. And sometimes there were just two sticks put up and a rope put across the to, to, to make the crossbar. It was very pr primitive in terms of what we are used to now. But after a while then, the GA decided in the 1930s that they would have had to have their own grounds because they couldn't be dependent on these farmers all the time. And then they would have you know, raise money. They would have had to have enclosed grounds, Kevin, so they could get money from the attendances. And then after a period of maybe 10 or 20 years, uh, the GA decided we need to start being serious about what we want to have for our games. And um, there was a man, uh, two men in particular were brilliant at it, uh, were Parik O'Keefe, who was the Ors Tura Hor, uh, the Director General, and a man called Martin O'Neill, who was the secretary of the Leinster Council, they're the guys who got it going. So within that then, you know, Tipperary, Father Ryan was very much involved in the development of the ground there. Thurless, as you probably know, Kevin, was originally the agricultural uh, society. Mm -hmm. And as I said, they're the people with the money and they own the land that was originally uh, there in, in, in their domain. And then it was Father Ryan who was, got committees together. And it was really the people of the town of Thurles got the money uh, to develop that ground and, 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 and to buy it first and then develop it. So it was a very slow start, but it was um, it was great. There were great people 
who de- who who I say they they had a vision. They were the frontiersmen, pioneersmen, whatever words we like to use, but they were the first people to do it, and we are um, benefiting from that today. Yeah, and do you think I suppose going forward there's a lovely picture as well of the the Connacht? I call it the Superdome, but the Connacht Air Dome in uh, in Beckham there, um, you know, which is a, a kind of like a national leader. Do you think now that's where we need to go? Do we need to embark on a new phase of kind of pitch of facility development because? You know, there's a, our numbers are booming, in the sense that there's a lot more girls. Kamogi uh, ladies football is is growing a growing a lot, and I know there's there are sister associations as such. But in time, you can really see a, a a much greater demand on existing playing facilities. That that particular um um building or that dome in 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 Mayo, uh, Kevin is an extraordinary. Uh, building. I was in there and uh, twice, and uh, the sheer size of it uh, is great. And they're able to have their FBD leagues in Mayo in there. Now, it is um, the cost of it and the maintenance of it, whether it is worth it for other provinces. People have said to me that we should have one in every province to be able to facilitate, especially when the weather has been on on unkind to uh, winter games, but whether or not, you know, last Sunday's match between Clanlara and um, Ballygunner, uh, would they have played that in the dome in Thurles if there was such a dome? I, I, I'm not sure. So I think we're very slow in changing. The dome itself was um, a, a marvellous piece of visionary thinking by John Prenty, who is the uh, secretary of the Connacht Council, um, but I think what we have to do is to see the benefits of it into the future and to in- and, and see what, what whether or not another one should be built or not. But you're right, we have to be innovative in our way of thinking as those people were 100 years ago when they bought the pitch in the first place. Absolutely. And again, part of this project, you've, you've got to go around all the, almost like being a tourist around all the, all the parts of Ireland. Just, I suppose, is there any pitch, I suppose, from each province that stood out to you? Either for location or the or the the people you met, just kind of as a kind of had, had that wow factor. Apart from Clonmel now situated, foot of commerce and all, we know it's the most picturesque pitch in Ireland. Well, I would have played. In fact, the photograph I have of Clonmel has the Schlieven on in the background, which was absolutely beautiful. And I would have played there a number of times myself. Played against Tipperary in a minor football championship match there. So, um, <laughs> I nice. I know the pace. But anyway, no, there were some marvelous grounds. Uh, the one that there are oh, sorry, not the one. There's a number of grounds, Kevin, that stood out, um, and all for various reasons. Um, I was up in a place called Lockheel, which is in the middle of Antrim, North Antrim, and the uh, the, the the pitch it would rival Thurles uh, for the surface, and the pride in which those people have in that ground is amazing. They're just a hurling club. In fact, Lockheel were All Ireland club champions on two occasions. And they are so proud of it that they have that. Um, I suppose the the surface, the 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 the, the 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 tender loving care they give to that ground is amazing. But one of the ones that stood out was for an unusual reason was a place called Clune in Leitrim, which is when I say Kevin, it's in the middle of nowhere. It is in the middle of nowhere, but it's a beautiful ground that has, uh, you know, they have their stand, they have their floodlights, they have their uh, scoreboard. And it is, there's only one house within um, 100 yards of the pitch. The town itself or the village itself is a mile a mile away. It's just an oasis in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, you, you, you see, well, where did those people, how did they come up with this um, ground in this area? But the way they, the detail they went into, the stand, the wheelchair access, all of the things that we take for granted, somebody had to put those there. Um, you know, obviously Cork has a beautiful stadium now. Killarney for the beautiful location uh, with the Kerry Mountains in the background and the uh, lakes of Killarney and the National Park. Now, my own town of Dungarvan wasn't a bad one either with the river going beside it and uh, the ring in the distance. So the strange thing about the grounds, Kevin, is that while I did the photographs with a drone, I took the hinterland, and it's the hinterland made it. Whereas you walk into Thurles, you don't get the benefit of you know the hills and in 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 the distance, or 
in Killarney, as you say, the 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 the, the mountain. So there's a there's a lot of different ones, but interestingly enough, in Ballycastle in Antrim, uh, when I took the drone, I found a couple of weeks later the, the piece of hinterland within the distance was actually the Mull of Kintyre in Scotland, well. which I didn't realise it until I saw uh, the Google Maps. To, I was trying to figure out where was that piece of land. And it is, um, yeah. you know. Uh, the, the the one with Derry with the Brandywell below it and the Greyhound track below that again and the River Foyle coming in around meandering around it, like it is I suppose to a large degree people have said to me about the photographs nearly make the book, but they're only a small part of it. Is I would hope that the detail in the book. Yeah, is absolutely. And just to give people a picture, of what I think makes it for me as well is the vivid stories of development anyone involved in the GA can go yeah geez that reminds of us now or, or whatever like that and some of the colourful characters and the force of personality at times required to get projects through and as well it's with the real intrinsic role of GA clubs and pitches in the life in, in the life of a of a place of a town there was a great story about uh, I'm not sure if you read it Kevin but on Nina uh, they wanted to have another tournament. Uh, it was the way of raising money at the time. And they agreed by a committee that they would give bicycles, bikes for the winners. And of course, people didn't trust the committee. So they said, we'll buy the bikes first to show that people that were, were genuine in our um, prizes. And um, But because there was bikes as prizes, uh, there were so many clubs and teams entered it became totally unwieldy and it had to be abandoned. Uh, the tournament itself, it went on and on and on. So I'm not too sure where the bikes went. I I'm, I wonder if there's a, a shed up there in Nina, Kevin, that has a whole lot of bikes there waiting to be given out for the winners of this tournament or not. Uh, look, at how, look at how things have moved on now. Now GA clubs are raffling <laughs> houses and heifers and... <laughs> Energy, energy yeah. retrofit. So things it are is, but the, the the mystery of where did the bikes go in Nina? So maybe you could ask your friends oh, in indeed. Nina, uh, who who uh, Connor Donovan, uh, or or, or um, uh, Michael, um, or Michael Cleary, Michael Cleary uh, where are the bikes? Mm-hmm. And Humphrey, just I suppose just before we kind of move off this again, this book brought you all over the country and. One of the interesting debates now is the role of, or like, you know, the growth of hurling or even the decline of hurling might be a a more accurate word in some of the weaker counties, although that's a horrible term in itself. You know, like we termed it like taking out out teams of national leagues and all sorts of other proposals. Now, again, what's your, your, you know, former Dublin manager, you have a great experience of, of the game. What's your, you know, overall feel towards that proposal and how do we grow the game of hurling in general? That's a big question um, to ask. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they've, they've withdrawn the motion to um, expel these um, clubs or counties from the National League. Um, it was a sad indictment of the lack of vision maybe within the GEA to look more detail into why are there hurlers and clubs being involved. I did a little bit of research and while there's, I think it's two or maybe three hurling clubs in Fermanagh, we just take Fermanagh for instance, uh, that there's 22 football clubs. And I would have, um, uh, I suppose, a, an idea that all of these clubs that are, we call it one sport club, should be, we, 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 we should investigate why isn't hurling played in those a lot of time is tradition, is people who say we don't have hurling here. But I ask a simple question is why don't they have hurling here? And it's not down to a club, it's not down to the GAA, it's down to people. And people decide what happens in their environment. And I have an idea that we should um, rate various counties or clubs in their uh, assessment of the um, contribution they made to the, the whole GEA. The, the GEA represents our main sports are hurling, football, rounders and handball. And then you have the ladies football and you have Komogi uh, uh, allied to those sports. And every club should really try to embrace those sports in. 
And for every sport they include in their club, I would give them a star. So if you're a one star, if you're football only, if you're hurling in football, you're two stars, three stars if you're Camogie and so forth, and that you could have up to five stars. Now, if there's no hurling in a football club or there's only one star only, the amount of support from the GA central support would reflect that. If there's two sports, you get two stars, that reflects that. And I can assure you, Kevin, that if it comes to All-Ireland ticket allocation, that the more stars you have as your club, the more money or the more All-Ireland tickets you get, they would, they, they, it might maybe motivate them to say, right, maybe we should be looking at this. But it all comes down to one aspect of it that we are not grasping, and that is it's about that people are preventing this from happening. It's not a club. A club is not. It, it, it's just an entity. It's made up of people. And I would go in and I do a forensic investigation into why these clubs are not having all sports. Now you have the possibility of not just having two hurling clubs in Fermanagh, you could have 22 hurling clubs in Fermanagh. But who's asking those questions? I don't believe anybody is asking the questions. There might be too hard a questions to ask, never, never mind the answers. But you will find it goes down to tradition. It is it, it is a legacy system that we've had for years. Why? And I'm just questioning that big time that we should be a be, 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 bit more. We should be harder on these people because to me, Kevin, and I, I don't say these words lightly, trust me, they are, unfortunately, they are, to me, they are bullies. They're intimidators. They are people who just do not want to see other sports come in. And to me, that is totally and utterly wrong. But there is a solution if the GAA uh, looked into it more more deeply. Mm, absolutely. That's very strong words. And I think it comes out of passion. You know, we do see at the moment, we do see, I suppose, the oasis in the middle of the desert, like the Taurine, even well, up in Antrim, if you even want to, want to call it that as well, that probably aren't getting enough support that they need to, to be able to grow to grow the game as well so you know just so we wrap up you're also a Dublin uh, a former Dublin senior manager do you think that again a couple of good years you could see you, you laid the foundations for the current success there getting Dublin back off the tier tier one there I know you're I know you won't claim that but um, how do you see the, the the state of the modern game compared to when you were managing then and and I suppose the load being placed on modern inter-county players it's 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 almost professional like, and um, the lifestyle or the life uh, scale of a hurler now, the intercounter has, has has lessened, uh, in 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 terms of their careers. Uh, just go back to the Dublin scenario. It for it, again, it's disappointing for a county like Dublin, with over a million people in it that were not winning all Ireland. And interestingly, Kevin. While Dublin are down in the records of having six All Ireland senior hurling titles, there's only one man from Dublin who has an All Ireland medal, and that was Jim Byrne back in the 1938. So we haven't, you know, they're all people from the country who are on those teams. But to go back to what has happened, there is there's a lot of work in Dublin, but we're not getting to the core of the issue about coaching within the schools that we need more. Uh, we, we 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 we're we, we're happy at a certain level of coaching, but we're not the intensity that's required to be able to compete. We have our own standard of good good club hurling. You know, there's about four or five very good clubs in Dublin, as you saw in Afina last Sunday against um, the old Auckland Gales. They gave them a good game, but we're not getting over the line. We will have the odd good game for Dublin, but consistency when it really comes down to it. And it's about first touch. It's about skill. It's about pace. It's about upper body strength. All the things that the other counties have. And we're not approaching those. And to me, one of the most important parts of any game is the mental fitness that people must have to be able to compete. I was I saw a piece about Richie Hogan said there that he believes that Kilkenny are the only team that competes with Limerick. Maybe Tipperary mightn't agree to that. Maybe Watford mightn't agree to that. But the reality is that, you know, he believes it. And that's the mentality that they want to come through. Same with Limerick. Limerick are there because they made it happen themselves over the years, especially at coaching. They were dynamic in the manner in which they went through that 
coaching process. We, in, in when I say we, I talk about Dublin hurling. We don't have that desire. We are, you know, the, the, probably in the last 10 years, obviously the best football county in the country. It's a pity we don't adapt that same approach to the, the, the hurling. Uh, and I think while we be finishing up here shortly, I could talk to you for another five hours about Dublin hurling, why it isn't happening, but it's basically down to one word, coaching. Mm, abs- absolutely. And it is just so hard to take that final step and to get that winning culture in in a panel or in, in a sport. Humphrey, it's been an absolute pleasure to discuss the books and uh, I suppose a whistle stop tour through the life of the GA as well. It's it's a great book, honestly. Um, you know, it's called a place to play. It's in all good bookshops now. It's an ideal present for Christmas. And just to watch out on the Premier View pod social channels, we'll be doing a giveaway or two in the next couple of days. So we'll be testing the knowledge of our our listenership with with the various GA facts. So Humphrey, thanks a million. Kevin, a delight to speak with you.